There was no democratic mandate in the election of 2010 for all these changes in the NHS. This NHS. The NHS. The NHS. The NHS. The NHS. The, NHS. the, NHS. the health service. The English NHS. The 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 NHS has been abolished. Different groups of NHS insiders in England are gathering right now to discuss what they know to be true. Some NHS doctors are deeply concerned that what appears normal on the surface has in fact undergone a tsunami of structural change which now leaves the door of the NHS blown wide open to closure and privatisation. The NHS has been abolished and what has taken place is a system modelled on the US where care is delivered by for-profit companies who can also charge patients and where NHS funded care is increasingly restricted and reduced where charges increasingly apply. You are the people who've got clinical skills. You should be the decision makers. What's going on here is in the hands of bureaucrats. It is in the hands of bureaucrats. It's McKinsey, Deloitte, it's the wealthy people that are just stealing back this NHS that belongs to us. When the coalition came into power, the NHS was one of the most cost-effective popular health services in the world, thanks to an improvement in chronic underfunding. This was the figure I was given. £110 billion is how much is spent every year on the NHS. That means over £100 billion a year of your money is up for grabs. a management that is uh, absolutely obsessed with performance targets because that's directly related to their performance pay, pay and their career progression and so staff get more disillusioned they're working harder and harder and they forget what they're there for which is patience and the system is rotten absolutely rotten the internal market in the NHS replaced a system that was cheap simple and successful. The previous medical leadership and a patient-centered ethos. Now, managers, not nurses and doctors, call the shots. The whole concept and the implementation of the internal market was and is required for full privatization and the takeover by US corporations to work. Would the creation of a market in the NHS have happened without Margaret Thatcher? That's absolutely where the narrative of the last 25 years begins. I think one of the most fascinating things about Thatcherism is the way it affected the Labour Party. And actually Margaret Thatcher herself said her greatest achievement in politics was Tony Blair and New Labour. He made a few public speeches on how the internal market was such a waste of money and time. However, once he got into power, he grabbed the internal market with both hands and uh, made it well established within the NHS. And in fact, um, got away with it, got away with what the Conservatives wouldn't have done because they were labelled the Labour Party. We no longer have a National Health Service here. We no longer have a Secretary of State for Health who can be totally held to account for failures in clinical care. We're increasingly moving down an Americanisation of our health care. Their healthcare costs about twice as much as other developed countries and their health outcomes are markedly inferior. In fact, they managed to achieve worse life expectancy and uh, worse infant mortality than some of the, the Eastern European countries who are managing to turn in superior performance for a sixth or an eighth as much money as the US spends on its system. A fifth of the patients in America have no cover at all. And this would be a disaster for the old and poor. It's saturated, they can't take any more out of the US, so they have to diversify and they have to find new niche markets. Which is why the NHS is such a trophy for them. Because if they can break open and succeed in breaking open the NHS to the marketplace, 
then because the NHS was a model maker for 60 years, it means that other countries are much more likely to follow suit. Oh, look what's happening in England, we will follow suit. You're not um, simply marching to an emotional drum. Well, right at the heart of everything myself and other people opposing the legislation want to do and put at the heart of it is patient care. And you cannot do your best for patients in a market-driven, you know, private providing healthcare system. The way I thought about how insane this all was is to introduce a similar system within your own household whereby you have parents and children setting up a system of fees and charges uh, so each time mother does something for the family she will charge the husband and the children let's say for making a meal um, the husband might charge the rest of the family each time he does some DIY or gardening. Uh, equally the children start charging the parents each time they show them some affection or they make them proud of, of being their parents. Uh, mother might charge the children for taking them to school. Um, but of course to, to have such a system in place you're going to need at least a manager, maybe an accountant, maybe two or three administrators to make sure the fees are set in an appropriate manner to make sure the charges are paid, uh, to send people reminders. At the end of all that, you end up with a reduced household budget and uh, you've wasted 10-15% of what you could spend on the family and I thought, uh, this is what's happening in the NHS. I want to see the internal market got rid of completely uh, unless somebody can prove me otherwise that this is of benefit to uh, delivering healthcare. Doctors, um, I'm sure, coming on this film will be thought to be Luddites and protecting their jobs. But in fact, doctors love change. Doctors lead change. If you go back from vaccination to antibiotics, to diagnostics, to vacay surgery. If, for instance, a radiologist doctor put the wire into his own heart before it was trialled on a patient to lead the change into interventional radiology. But it has to be evidence-based and prove that it's clinically of benefit to the patient. Most new hospitals today are built with private finance initiative money. Payments required even if a hospital closes. They spent over £11 billion. With that, they are going to have to pay back over £79 billion. Private companies are contracted to manage and complete projects and these can last for the investor for up to 30 years. It is like going to a loan shark and a good example of how Money is being drained out of the system and redirected away from services to profiteers. PFIs are an expensive method of borrowing to deliver attractive, risk-free returns for investors. And the public still don't own the hospitals. These facilities built with this money are unreasonably protected and their debt provides a way of justifying closures. PFI is, uh, you know, pernicious financial idiocy. Um, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it was a short-term answer to a long-term problem, and the taxpayers and the patients are suffering as a result. Most of the hospitals whose A&E services are currently under threat have neighbours who have large PFI debts. Do you think there's anything unethical about the uh, PFI situation? Absolutely, I think it's... it's... I don't think it's at all unreasonable to describe it as scandalous and monstrous and I think if the full extent of it was actually made public it would be a national scandal. Profits can rise to as much as an 1100% rate of return. For every PFI hospital that's open and running you could have had three hospitals open and running for the same price and that includes the staffing as well. The NHS was founded on the basis of need, so you're raising money according to need and not ability to pay. 
and then you're distributing the funds through the system and the services according to need and not ability to pay. So when you bring in a private element with shareholders or whatever, uh, or like the PFI, then you're actually moving away from the intentions that Parliament intended. Parliament votes for that money on that basis. It's the shutting down of cheaper to run publicly owned hospitals in favour of those with PFI debts. PFI is the best example where the banks are rebuilding their balance sheets on the back of PFI hospitals and schools. So money that's intended for services is going straight into the balance sheet of the bank, banks and the investors. That's quite extraordinary, which means their children have appalling schools, they may have modern glitzy schools, but they're cramped, they don't have enough staff, and they don't have enough books, and the same, sorry, and the same is happening in hospitals. They wanted a guaranteed flow of public money uh, underpinned by government. That is what the PFI was about. And can you do anything about the PFIs, or are they kind of fait accompli? Well, they're all signed, but nothing is ever irreversible, depending on the political situation, as we know. Um, so the first thing that a government that wanted to reopen, do would be to reopen all the contracts and of course they're all commercial and confidence and it's particularly pertinent at the moment because these contracts um, are subject to indexation so they're rising with inflation at a time when budgets are falling for the NHS and they're also part of this whole um, uh, LIBOR um, interest rate scandal, interestingly enough, because you've got interest rate swaps and indexation swaps going on. And of course we're already seeing quite a lot of, of extra fatalities due to people having to be driven around by ambulance where their local a &E has been shut. So previously they, their lives would have been saved and now they're dying in ambulances. The government are still pursuing PFI, either because their, their friends make a lot of money out of it, or because they're ideologically committed to this, or because they're stupid, quite frankly. Don't believe the latter. From 1997 to 2009, during the Blair and Brown New Labour governments, 101 out of 135 hospitals were built using PFI loans. I think there was about 15 people involved in the elected caesarean to get them out and uh, the, the, the level of care was just incredible and you just can't imagine how how this area will cope with anything like this triplets uh, if they don't have the maternity Many of the doctors I have spoken to here have told me that the founding principles of the NHS have, in their opinion, been betrayed by politicians. There was no democratic mandate in the election of 2010 for all these changes in the NHS. In fact, the government is using choice and the austerity argument to push through massive programs of hospital closure and at the same time privatise what is left. How do you personally, Jackie Davis, feel about the broken promises by government? Um, I'm old enough now to, to know that politicians promise what they can't or won't deliver when they get in. I can only speak from my personal experience, but in my experience, the objectives and the targets come first. I've seen that again and again. But I sometimes think, in my saddest moments, that the, probably the people that are driving health policy are those that are neither ill or have ever used the NHS and I worry that it's being driven by people who have no concept of what it's like to be a patient within a national health service. I suppose you have to ask the question, did I ever believe those promises in the first place? And because, remember, I've been working on the NHS since the very early 1990s and privatisation. This is the very last piece, which is the abolition of the NHS, but in order to get there, it's taken them 20 years of steady dismantlement um, the only thing that was left in place was the Secretary of State's duty to supply and secure um, health care for all 
and also um, to distribute the funds according to need. That's the last piece to go. Under the culture that's been operating in the NHS, probably for the last decade, it has been unacceptable to admit that you don't know, that you've made a mistake, that you took a risk that didn't pay off, or that the system simply isn't working. What you're required to do is say, um, everything's all right here, and then go away and fix it. What direct effect these kind of betrayals have on your patients here in South East London? Well, I've lost count of the examples of patients where I've sent them in either to casualty or they've been admitted, and I've been quite shocked when they've been discharged or sent home. Um, many examples of poor assessment in casualty, uh, assess many examples of premature discharge from hospital. I can only assume the clinicians at the other end are either frustrated or have no capacity or having to make decisions which they're not entirely happy with because of lack of resource. And does the burden of that patient's health then come back to you? Of course, I feel, I feel let down myself. I feel very sorry for the patient. Uh, I feel that our duty to the patient has been um, failed and it destroys any job satisfaction that you may have. This act enables private companies to hide behind the NHS logo. This act means private companies will be able to pick off the easiest procedures. This act will, through corporate lawyers, favour big business. One of the many things attributable to the Health and Social Care Act of 2012 is that it makes commissioning costly and complex. Private companies are already taking on commissioning roles in places such as Hounslow. And of course, expensive contracts would remove yet more money from patient care. This gigantic thing, the you know, size of 10 London telephone directories, is pulled out of the hat. You know, wh where did that come from? I don't think they wrote that between the time when in the, the election. It has been argued that it is quite deliberate. And it's deliberate in order to open up our public health services to commissioning. You are clinicians and you are up against a very legal framework and in a sense you kind of need legal minds to assist you in your uh, need to articulate what is going on. Do you feel under-armed in this struggle? I think the, the, the battle against you know, this legislation was incredibly difficult for doctors because it was so technical and legal. It is something of enormous complexity which I suspect only corporate lawyers are going to be able to understand. In order to understand a bill of that size and magnitude, you need to have expertise in public law, constitutional law and commercial law as well as health policy. Uh, and actually, you know, doctors individually and even as a group don't have that. Anything which is written by lawyers and politicians without very much medical input can't be in the best interest of providing and structuring a good health system. People do think that McKinsey's management consultants had a huge input into it. It's something like ten times the length of the original act that brought the health service into being in 1948. But fortunately there was a group uh, led by uh, Professor Alison Pollock and the public interest lawyer Peter Roderick who did have the expertise in, uh, and they clearly articulated what the bill was about which was hugely helpful and they published in the British Medical Jour Journal and the Lancet to say that effectively the English NHS was going to be abolished. Immediately I could see very simply at the beginning of the bill that they were abolishing the legal duty on the government to provide the NHS and I was shocked and thought, I can't believe they do this, why is this out there in the news? There were an extraordinary number of briefings that came out explaining that this was the abolition of the NHS, that the duty on the Secretary of State to provide and secure health care was going, and that the democratic basis, uh, legal basis for the NHS was being destroyed. I think a lot of people don't understand the significance of whether there is a legal duty or there isn't. 
and in the context of the NHS, it was the legal duty, if you like, was the seminal basis for everything that flowed from that. So you kind of cut, the, you know, you've untethered, if you like, the health service from the government. Should it be rewritten? I think it should be withdrawn. It was complicated to start with. It then got worse because there was a coalition, so the Lib Dems um, had to come in and put their oar in. And in fact, Nick Timmins in his book Never Again says that when the coalition was formed, um, uh, uh, Oliver Letwin, he who said there won't be an NHS five years after the Tories come in, and Danny Alexander, Orange Book Liberal, Democrat, got together and, and made something out of Lansley's proposals that would suit the Lib Dems. And Lansley was left out of the whole process. So Lansley's plans, which may well have been more coherent, were then rendered less coherent by Letwin and Alexander, and then even less coherent um, by all the amendments and changes, trivial that they were, that got piled on top of it uh, as it got arm wrestled through you know, two years in Parliament or whatever it was. So it is now a hugely Byzantine mess. So it doesn't need to be rewritten, it needs to be scrapped. Ultimately for politicians, what seems to me to be more important, the most important thing for them, is power, is not actually the issue. It, all the time, the desire to be the people making the decisions is going to trump whatever the issues are underneath that. One of the government's major tools is really public ignorance and professional apathy to drive through these ridiculous reforms which will actually benefit no one but the commercial interests and perhaps politicians who will go on to serve on boards of these companies. British Rail was run down for some years systematically before the privatisation. And in fact that is a standard privatisation strategy, it makes it easier. Um, the expert on this is Oliver Letwin MP and he has written a nice book called Privatising the World in 1988 and in that he sets out a number of important tactics for governments who are trying to privatise public services against the wishes of their population. And among them there are a couple of key steps. One is to restrict the budget so that the public service gets worse and worse and worse and then privatisation can be represented as a step up, which of course in practice generally it is not. But if you make the public service bad enough, people will perceive it that way. So it's a deliberate policy. The full extent of the repercussions of the 2012 Health and Social Care Act are only just starting to be felt. And I think it's only in years to come that we will see the full impact of that, but certainly I know from my colleagues and fellow clinicians that they do feel that the impact is already being felt. Healthcare is a global business, uh, turning over in excess of five trillion dollars a year. It's the world's biggest single employer, and uh, you know it's going to have political ramifications. You're spending that much money, you've got that many people involved. If journalists aren't aware of that, then they can't really do a proper job reporting. There was a complete failure to report what the health and social care bill was about and what was at stake for the public. Some doctors have tried to tell me that the media are allowing to go unchallenged negative stories about the NHS originating, they say, from the Department of Health and Health Ministers. The British Household Survey of 2010 showed the highest ever satisfaction with the NHS. By not telling the whole story, only the negative one, we create a kind of bad propaganda. By not reporting the whole story, the media have not been reporting the good. They have not been keeping the record straight. The Commonwealth Fund, for example, a non-partisan US research organization, found the NHS to be the best in the developed world, and the US, the model to which our politicians now aspire, the worst. And some pretty senior doctors have complained to me that no distinction is made when the service failure is provided by private provider companies, for example, Knight GP cover and the private breast implant scandal. Why is it that the media is no longer um, representing 
uh, the the public's public interest. I don't think that the media can come out of the bill and the and the act very very well at all. I'm afraid. I just see the mainstream media as having swallowed the government line, and I I I, I don't learn anything from them. Uh, and um, I, in many ways, I, I feel quite sickened by the way the, the mainstream media behave. I'm afraid around the around the bill and around the NHS and the and the government's political agenda generally. The media are bottom feeders, they need to create a story, constant flux is a story, but they're never really concentrating on the quality of care, they don't understand it. Um, they're never really interested in the patient, they're interested in political machinations, Punch and Judy, and that's how the media work. And they're not being paid to do the sorts of investigative journalism that there might have been 20 or 30 years ago. In fact, they don't actually have any sources inside the hospitals often. Um, and it's difficult because newspapers have no resources. These stories can be legally complex. Uh, you can have patients who've really suffered, doctors who've really suffered. When they do get angry, when they see what's actually happened, my fear is it's going to be too late. You know, the, the wheels have already come off and, uh, you know, the horse has already bolted. So we really need to try and raise awareness right now. We didn't come to work thinking, I'm going to do a bad day's work today. Um, being told that your service is bad. When you're looking around, you're seeing everybody working really hard and the vast majority of people are really happy with the service that they're getting. So it was a wicked, wicked thing to do. I've been working abroad for quite some time. And before I went away, the image I have of, of the NHS and the media is about angels. The nurses that are selfless and work so hard and make us well and they care about us and look after us. And then I go abroad for a decade and a half delivering medical services overseas and when I come back the way the NHS is portrayed in the media is very very different. Suddenly it's catastrophe after catastrophe and every initiative that is put forward somehow seems to have the effect of further privatising the system. Foundation trusts go against the grain of the original NHS. Every hospital in England now must become an independent business entity. Breaking up hospitals into foundation trusts is essential to achieve privatisation. By breaking them up into small chunks you make it easier to pick them off one by one. It is a form of concealed destruction, divide and rule. Bankruptcy, what will happen then? I really do not understand the point of this target except to make hospitals independent organisations not accountable to anybody except monitor. There's a lot of very competent and very dedicated managers in the NHS but they're faced with a very difficult dilemma. They are making continual trade-offs between the best interests of their organisation, the political directives which are coming down from on high, and the day-to-day -day problems of running their complicated and complex trusts. The reality of foundation trusts means uh, allowing hospital trusts a degree of financial and other independence, which of course must have seemed uh, very attractive to them. But the flip side of that uh, is that they do run up large debts, then they can't be bailed out like, by the Department of Health. The use of language would have delighted Orwell. Um, these things are labelled meaningless terms, which then change, the, change and the, the underlying problem doesn't change. You know, you've, you've got to have hospitals, you've got to staff them, you've got to have beds, um, and, and calling them a different name is just, is just meaningless. It's the same as the term patient choice. It's an empowering term. But patient choice is all about turning citizens into consumers to consume healthcare in a, in a market which in a single payer system when you've got a, a fixed ceiling of income, you know, driving people to consumers, consumers consume 
it, it, it's crazy because you will bankrupt the healthcare system. Hospital trusts are merging, but mergers are simply a code for major closures of hospitals, accident and emergency departments and services. I don't think the public are aware that these foundation trusts can now raise funds on the open market. Uh, they can earn up to 49% of their income from private patients. People are actually considering each trust as a business and you must not talk to the opposition. Any time that you see the word hospital trust or hospital trust merger, you should be thinking service closure and staff cuts and reductions. And there's not a single merger in the country that isn't going ahead that's not predicated upon that. And the coalition has even set up a government-owned company called Propco to assist all this. This is the sell-off of your NHS. It's intrinsically related to the Mid-Staffordshire uh, problem, which was desperate to get to foundation trust status, tried to hit all its financial targets, put those financial targets first, and what that meant was in order to save money to hit those targets, it had to cut staff. The disaster there is a prime example of how the market reforms and the privatisation has led directly to patient harm. Indeed, it said pressure on management to put financial performance first and the enthusiasm with which management embraced this goal was what resulted in management cutting ward staffing below the minimum where safe care was possible. So if you were the NHS, which in a sense you are, do you feel under attack? Of course, absolutely. When you have these trusts going bust, then you can either close down those hospitals, those NHS hospitals and the services they provide, or you can possibly bring in a private provider to take them over. Um, so it's, it's, a, um, it's definitely a deliberate strategy in this process. Patients will be starting to wonder uh, when you know care is starting to be rationed, when finances are, are, are very tight. You know, is the doctor you know doing what's best for me, or or are they prescribing that treatment or not prescribing that treatment because it's cheaper or it's too expensive? Uh, and that really undermines that trust, which is right at the heart of medicine. And that that's what's embittering and angering so many doctors, because we feel it's just you know breaking the heart of of the profession. Uh, and, and that doctor-patient relationship, the social contract. First of all, the re revolving door goes in two ways. Not only do we have parliamentarians who've enacted policies going out and working, uh, being paid by the private sector who benefit from those policies, but the private sector placing a lot of their people within government so, for instance, I think the Department of Health had a commercial directorate um, for a long time, which was almost entirely run by people put in there by outside private companies with an interest in the, in the privatisation of, of, of public services, um, and particularly the big management consultants. And here is just a small selection. It's not right uh, that you know a public sector worker, uh, you know, high up in the Department of Health, can be there one minute and then within you know months uh, it could be working for the private sector. I mean, there are rules about that, but they don't always seem to be followed. These people are hugely influential and get paid a great deal of taxpayers' money to do that. How do you stop it? Well, the, the business of um, parliamentarians going out and benefiting financially from the policy decisions they've made could surely be dealt with by just putting a moratorium on, 
on them doing that for a certain period of time after they leave. It's actually bound to happen that you get a revolving door culture if you introduce the private sector into healthcare simply because all these relationships occur. The pace at which the NHS is being privatised and marketised and outsourced and commercialised is happening very, very quickly and it's been coupled with a hollowing out and closure of the public services. It's a complete subversion of the democratic process. It makes people very cynical, of course, about democracy when they see that nexus of power and influence. When the stench becomes so rotten, um, then you have to call it you have to call it what it is. It's okay. corruption with a capital C. The Gladstonian uh, traditions of civil service and administration and proper functioning bureaucracies, they're all absolutely being destroyed at the moment. So everything is being outsourced. Uh, patient data is being outsourced, the information systems on the public are being outsourced, even the census has been outsourced to an arms company as it happens. Um, and people, public, don't know about this, so all the public functions are being eroded and destroyed, and we're actually moving into a really corrupt period where we're going to be no better than some of these third world countries, which we sort of deride for being having corrupt dictatorships. There are civil service, civil servants who are meant to scrutinise this stuff. There doesn't seem to be very much scrutiny going on. CCGs are responsible for £88 billion per annum. This is 80% of the entire NHS budget. CCGs are formed of groups of GPs charged with buying services for their patients. The rationale is to give decision-making control to clinicians, but in fact their hands are tied and have been tasked with choosing which hospital services to tender out to the lowest bidder and which services to ration, they have become the tool for dismantling hospital services. Many GPs uh, really welcome these, the, this at the beginning because there has been traditionally difficulties between GPs and, and primary care trusts who had the money. And so they just thought, we'll bypass that, we'll have the money, and we'll really make a difference for our patients. Now, if you give people these huge budgets, commissioning isn't just about paying for health care. It's much bigger than that. It's about planning health care. It's about all sorts of other services in the communities, from you know child abuse to prisons to vaccinations, that sort of thing. Uh, so most GPs, quite frankly, they don't have the training, they don't have the time, and they don't have the expertise, and they don't have the interest. The fear is it will be the GP entrepreneur type who will be having all the power and making decisions which aren't really in the patient's interest. Structures that you need have been dismantled and it's not in the CCG powers to put those structures back in place again. That leads us to the next uh, question which is well who, who will uh, do the, the, the commissioning and, and that's really an entry point again for the private sector. Many GPs have interests in private healthcare arrangements and will be re referring to their, pa their patients to those. So we're going to have the private sector holding all that NHS money, doing the commissioning process and buying the NHS services from guess who the private sector are going to be increasingly involved in supplying NHS services. So of course it's like having B Dracula in charge of the blood bank. The old NHS, every single person in every single area was covered. What the government's doing with cl clinical commissioning groups is moving towards um, pools of people like insurance pools. And as you all know with insurance pools not everybody is covered. So you're going to be in the, into the nightmare of the American marketplace where people have to look at the small print of their plans to see what's covered and then they have to take up top-up insurance and all sorts of other co-insurance policies. And indeed we're beginning to see the opening up of user charges and user fees in areas such as cancer therapy. A lot of time we're spending away from patients, away from the surgery, attending meetings and business meetings and budgetary meetings. But for big companies, 
um, the big multinationals. Of course, that's, that's their business. Their business is tendering for contracts. As I fear services will decline, the government will be in a position to, number one, say it's no longer their responsibility, and also to point the finger at the GP commissioners. And that's going to happen faster and faster, so that people who have a stroke, for example, will find that their care is time limited, they're no longer eligible for speech um, therapy or physiotherapy or all the occupational health services that they once received. Increasingly that's been time limited, but that will now become much more arbitrary and down to the, uh, the CCG to decide. The CCG and the providers have enormous discretion over who gets care, and that's the bottom line. GPs have not been empowered to improve services for their patients. They have been told to spend less money on patient care. Contracts are now awarded on lowest price. It is almost as if the GPs have been handed an axe. I must decide now where it should fall. Sadly, many are leaving medical practice in the UK, creating a predictable workforce crisis. Family doctors are now being so deliberately destabilised by this removal of funding that it already threatens over 100 medical practices in this country. This is just the start. Because the doctors are in charge of the budget, or the GPs are in charge of the budget, and they do the rationing, they are going to have people standing in their surgery actually being quite violent. I mean, have GPs thought about that? Because that is what I can imagine could happen you get somebody who is maybe not very educated, doesn't understand, and keeps pressing this doctor, and the doctor can't do anything. Some of them have a very dodgy track record of paying millions of dollars of fines in the US, for instance for bad behaviour. They don't even bother to go to court to contest these charges. They just pay up because they're going to make another million dollars just down the road. The government continues to push us to the American model of healthcare, which is the most expensive and unfair system. The FBI is investigating NHS private provider HCA, Health Corporation of America, after a nurse blew the whistle. Investigations show 50% of heart operations performed by HCA in Florida were unnecessary. Patient notes had been faked to justify the carrying out of the procedures and billing for them. According to Donald Berrick, the ex-head of Medicare and Medicaid in the US, in 2011, the estimated cost of fraud in the US was between $82 billion and $272 billion, upwards of 10% of the total spend. Hidden behind the NHS logo, these companies expand. The vectors for this are the large management consultants like McKinsey, like PwC. They actually make it happen. They move around the world giving advice and they are the vectors of the um, neoliberal ideology of marketization and commercialization. All of these marketization reforms was introduced on the premise of uh, greater efficiency. That of course the age-old argument that the public sector is, is some leviathan bureaucracy which is encased in red tape and that it needs to be reformed to become cost-effective. The reality is that uh, the internal market itself alone, mainly through increased uh, numbers of uh, administrative and managerial staff, led to um, about a 10% uh, rise in the NHS's budget, which by today's terms is around 10 billion per year. 10 billion pounds. Pre-Thatcher, the administration costs for the NHS were 5%. Post-Blairite, the administration costs were 14%. And the likely percentage by the end of all these proposed changes is over 30%. You make profits by cutting back on costs. Costs are staff. Um, costs are people, are patients who cost a lot of money. And so what they'll do, what they're already doing, is downgrading staff and turning away patients who are expensive. You know, what they want to deal with is a one-off episode in somebody who's basically fit will get better and go away. They don't want patients with comorbidities, they don't want emergency services, um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're basically, they're there to make money, and the money they make will be out of us.
I think you've got to see this as having been a very long-term project and this is happening at all sorts of different levels. You've got the transatlantic flow from the civil servants and the Department of Health and the MPs and the ministers who go to the US and they are brainwashed. Um, and then you've also got trade negotiations going on at the level of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, but also even in the EU, where in exchange for um, one set of, um, you know, say, deals on agriculture, then countries will voluntarily liberalize and open up their services. Does it make you angry? Completely, yes, uh, very angry, because it's something I believe most people who work within the NHS really value. It's uh, a very civilizing society. It treats people independent of their ability to pay, and you largely get the treatment you need. The government now is pursuing two strategies, a strategy of downsizing, closing down all the public services that we the people own uh, and that belong to us. They're just closing that down and at the same time they're transferring what remains to the private corporate sectors. And then we have TTIP. Alongside this wholesale carve-up of the NHS, secret negotiations are taking place over a new so-called trade deal, which will give foreign companies the right to sue the UK government if denied the opportunity for all comers to bid on the carve-up of the NHS. The government would be unable to block this. It would be out of their hands. It's all about removing regulations so companies can profit. And of course, it also removes protection for those working for the NHS. And it will put corporate power on a par with government. These are absolutely worrying times because the NHS is on the verge of extinction. It's, it's very much imperiled. Vested interests behind this have effectively sold this dummy, sold this lemon to the public. They've played a blinder. They've really um, managed to conceal the hidden agenda extremely well. What happens under choice is that providers can pick and choose, not patients, who all want services closer to home. There was one more thing, perhaps worst of all. It is crucial, is it not, for any health service to allow employees to speak openly and freely about what they consider a risk to patient care. But huge amounts of money are being spent on gagging clauses and lawyer's fees to buy silence. Genuine concern is ignored, as we saw again in mid-Staffordshire, to protect government policy. The sorts of issues that, on which I raised concerns included patient safety, it included probity, it included gross inefficiencies and wasting of public money in ways which led to avoidable loss of benefit to the local population. Do you think there is such a thing going on whereby members of the NHS are unable to speak out for fear of retribution? Absolutely. There's absolutely no doubt about it. In a number of cases I was told in no uncertain terms that I had stepped out of line Having raised concern, it was now my job to keep quiet. I was not to raise it to publicly accountable bodies. I was not to take it anywhere else. That was it. That my duty as a manager was to the corporate team and to the corporate objectives and the targets of the day. My duties did not lie with uh, the wider public. So who exactly is doing the intimidating? It's, a, it's again, it's about the system being driven by the finances and not patient needs. So anybody who steps out of line with that system is brought into check and it comes from the top. It comes from the chief executive uh, of the NHS who was David Nicholson all the way down. It's part of the management consultant and human resources are no longer there uh, at all to protect 
the individual employee, they're much more there to make sure that the will of management is being carried out. And you're seeing it because um, the idea of uh, complaints being brought on people and people being put on long-term gardening leave, these are all tools and mechanisms. There's an armory of different policies um, that, chief, uh, that trusts actually have at their disposal. And further up the chain of command, the imperative became shut down this awkward story. This is embarrassing and causing, embarrass causing embarrassment to ministers of whatever political colour was not acceptable. That was a higher order offence, if you like, than actually admitting that there was something that might be wasting public money or actually leading to harm for patients. In fact, the system is set up to keep us at bay. So what happens is, if you alert somebody to something, you'll be passed on to an investigator or you'll be passed on to a regulator and then the feedback that you get is we're going to wait until the outcome of this investigation. Then months later, after a very protracted and convoluted course which is very, very difficult to keep track of, the conclusion will be that there's no case to answer or that things have moved on. Have you been intimidated? Well, I've been intimidated would suggest that I have been uh, subject to bullying. That's, that's up to others to interpret. Um, but I do remember when I was doing all the work on the private finance initiative, actually having the chairman of the trust phone me up at home one evening to ask me what I wanted. So that was the offer of a bribe. I was told by the press officer of a strategic health authority that I should reflect on the fate of the late Dr. David Kelly, who was found dead in a ditch with his wrist slashed, as an example of what happens to whistleblowers, that they come to no good, that they end up suicidal, or unfortunate things happen to them. It was an overt threat. I do know that when the UCLH Trust was signing its PFI deal and I made my objections and asked them to document it, I had no voting rights but I was on the Trust board, not one single person spoke to me as they filed out. And I actually, so I suppose what you have is a culture of silence. The government reason for introducing all these changes and their explanations of what would happen if they did not introduce them was just a smokescreen. They said the NHS can't go on like this. Well, it can and it should remain a universal, publicly funded, provided healthcare system which remains the envy of the world. They said we can't afford the NHS. As we have seen, we are following a route towards a more expensive and wasteful service with armies of unnecessary intermediaries draining public funds. They said it will get rid of bureaucracy. However, the pursuit of the insurance route will only increase it. They said it will give power to doctors, but in fact it will take this power away. Instead of thinking about which patients they should care for, they will have to think about which services they should ration. They said we will empower patients and give them more choice. But what we have seen is the closure of local facilities. Real choice will be given to corporate profiteers. They said there will be more transparency, but in fact there is less transparency. Public bodies are being replaced by business entities hiding behind commercial confidentiality clauses. They said there will be no decisions made about you without you and yet they are now hiding behind Orwellian doublespeak. They said this is not the privatisation of the NHS. Well, what is it then when private companies are extracting profit from the sick for their shareholders? Patients, doctors, nurses and the public at large have been systematically lied to by our political masters who are doing the bidding, it would appear, for their corporate friends. All these tens of thousands of people out there who are now beginning to campaign and mobilise, it's very important that they sustain that momentum and um, keep informing and allowing the public to know what's happening. The huge changes that are sweeping in are neither um, proven to be clinical or financially beneficial. There's no piloting, there's no auditing.
I feel duty bound as a doctor to speak up on behalf of my patients and what, what can affect their livelihoods and potential health in the future is a system that is set up to crumble and to fail them. So in a sense you're simply doing your job? I see this as an extension of my job. I need to speak out when I feel patient care is being threatened on such a large scale. We need people to sit down, look at the whole business of purchaser-provider split in the NHS, the buying and selling of healthcare between different elements of the health service. It only happens in England, it doesn't happen in Scotland, it doesn't happen in Wales. They've turned their back on it because it doesn't work. And we need to say, this has been a 20-year costly failure. In fact, the Health Select Committee said, this has been a 20-year costly failure. So why the hell are we doing it? This film began with very little knowledge on this filmmaker's part and what was really happening with the NHS. The doctors who approached me with their concerns are very committed people, but I was wary initially of what I might think. Yet all the points raised in this film I have seen with my own eyes, especially the failure of the media to report what is really going on. The doctors who approached me are right. We are losing something very special indeed. Something cheaper, fairer, and available to all, which you will not get with the private model, unless the public, people, speak out and do something about it, which I hope in a way this film has tried to do.